anchors up, sells it full. Welcome to the Sloopcast. How are you doing today? Austin, filling in for Kyle uh, today, we have Austin. Yeah. Hey guys, how's it going? Back at it again to guest spot for Kyle. Happy to be here. Um, talk a little Buckeyes, talk some season report cards, um, see how we did over the whole 2022 is, season. It's a this big is the big. This is the big scarlet and grade. Mm-hmm. This is this is this is the big scarlet and grade. Uh, this is the season long final report card season ending scarlet and grade. Um, Austin, do you want to you want to introduce yourself? You want me to introduce you? Uh, you've done the show once before. Um, we weren't on huddle at that time, though, so you, you might be uh, in front of some new faces. Yeah, I've been a Buckeye fan for uh Basically, my whole life grew up in near Youngstown, Ohio. I currently live in uh, Florida. I coach a little football, so I know a little bit of things. Um, I was unfortunately at the Peach Bowl, so that was <laughs> not great. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit about me. I've been a mod on our Discord server, uh, discord.thesloopcast.com, for a little while now. Always be um, plugging. Always be plugging. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a little bit about me, and uh, happy to just be here talking football again, filling in for Kyle as he's, he's busy, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I say no more nonsense. Let's get to grading. Um, Austin talks like I talk, which means long windedly. So we probably should get right to it. Yeah, so, we, we can't mess around. Ky- Kyle's the man of few words. He doesn't. There's not a high volume of words with Kyle. It's quality or but, quantity for him. But it's quality for yeah, it's quality yeah. for him. You and I are just rambles. All right, but let's uh let's bring up the report card. Two hour show incoming, says Spikes. It could be closer to two hours than it is 30 minutes, I'll say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, now a couple notes before we start this. Um one, we we really should be basing this off of our preseason expectations. Uh, you know, in all of our previous Scarlet and Great episodes, we sort of base it off of our expectations for the given position group going into the game. So it's like, you know, we expect CJ Stroud to do great things as an example. Um, so we grade him. We grade the quarterbacks. We're not grading CJ Stroud. We're grading the quarterbacks. But, you know, so that's where that's a, that uh, example sort of breaks down. But yeah. But regardless, position example, but it wasn't the best. The yeah, idea. it was not the best. But yeah, we we are going to grade based off of, off of our expectations. Um, our expectations coming into the game, or in this case, expectations coming into the season. So with that in mind, you know, so sort of everyone put yourself into a August mindset and then be ready to jump back and forth between August and January. And all right, um, let's let's start. Let's start right at the top. Um, coaching. Um, this is the coaching staff as a whole. I think this is our opportunity, at least in part to grade Ryan day, maybe f- first and foremost, but the, the coaching staff as a whole. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's tough coming off of a, such a heartbreaking loss. However, season Ohio as a whole. State, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm trying not to have those those glasses on, but it's like Ohio State as a whole this season let me down a little bit in the coaching aspect, especially in the bigger games. Um, you know, if we're if we're talking coaching as a whole and like situational decisions and and things like that, and I th- I think a lot about um, I, I wouldn't go as far to say D plus. Uh, I actually think it was it was better this season I think than it was last season as a whole. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't, don't feel like I can go too much higher than like a flat B. Um, I think there's definitely room for improvement, um, right. but it could have been worse. And I think the last game of the season, the coaching was probably some of the best that it had been all season. Um, and the coaching right. early in the season was actually really good. I mean, you go back to the Notre Dame game and it's like, okay, like, and we'll go into it a little bit when we talk about defensive coaching, but, you know, only giving up 10 points to what turned out to be a pretty good Notre Dame team. Right, um, and that you know that running back that they have is really good, and obviously they're not the same team they were then as they are now. But you know the principle still applies, and so I'll, I'll go flat B for that one. I'm gonna go a little bit higher, and I'm gonna go a little bit higher for first and foremost everything you said. I think I agree with. I don't disagree with anything you said, except maybe the final grade. 
Um, and Jared has been saying that about Notre Dame. Yeah, um, I have been. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit higher because I think we also have to acknowledge the challenges of this season, which is probably more of a, I was going to say injury rich, but maybe it's actually injury poor season than we've seen from Ohio state in recent years, you know, um, riddled, that's a good riddled. Thank, thank you. Spikes injury riddled Wonderful. season. Um, you know, they go into the game with Georgia without their best wide receiver. They didn't have JSN basically the entire season. Let's just say the yeah. entire season. They went into that game without. Well, they uh, let's also just say for the sake of brevity that they also didn't have chop for the game against Georgia because they had him for one, Once maybe two drives. Yeah. <laughs> he, um, he only ran the ball a couple of times. So, right. So they didn't have their best two running backs going into that game. And both of those guys were nicked up basically the entire season as well. It, it felt like there was like, a OK, which running back are we going to get this week? Right. It seems like one of them would be healthy any given week. It almost felt like it was in the back of my head. And I don't think I ever said this. It almost felt there for a minute like they were doing it on purpose, just keeping one of them out per game. <laughs> um, just going on a rest cycle. Yeah, right. Um and then, you know, you lose Marvin Harrison because I, I, I'm just saying, I think we give them a much higher grade had they beat Georgia. I think they beat Georgia if Marvin Harrison doesn't leave. It was just it was an overall injury riddled season. And I think that has to fall into the coaching as well. Um, so I think I'm going to with everything Austin said, but with a little bit of a bonus, I think I'm going to say um, like an A minus. Um, well, I well, I think that it, it I mean, it'll, and it'll bleed a little bit into offensive coaching, which is the fact that if you think about it, most of those injuries and not all, because, you know, there were some obviously some issues in the secondary and things like that and a little bit on the defensive line. But most of those injuries were on offense. I mean, if you think about it, by the end of the Peach Bowl, Ohio State was down their number one, two and three running backs coming into the season. Henderson was out. Pryor was out. Uh, Chop was out receivers jsn was out marvin harrison was out those are the two guys that you expected to account together for well over 2,000 yards and both of those guys were out that's not to say that we didn't have talented guys in the field obviously you've got a mecca Buka, and you've got julian fleming who had awesome seasons and you know a mecca obviously a little bit more than julian fleming who came on a little bit more towards the end of the season but um off, if you're looking at just the offensive coaching um, i think that you know we're obviously very rich at receiver would have liked to have seen a little bit more rotation with JSN being out, but I mean, it's hard to rotate guys when you see a Mekek Buka and Marvin Harrison going out and doing what they did. But with Julian Fleming struggling a little bit more, I would have liked to see a little more rotation out of the receivers. But beyond that, they kind of just did whatever they could. Um, my biggest qualm, as it was most of the season with the offensive coaching, is the play calling of Ryan Day. Um, that's been a hot topic over these past couple of weeks. Do you want and to transition I, that part of it into the offensive coaching discussion? Yeah, is that where we're going next? Do you want to go defensive co next? No, we're going to just go down the line here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, play calling, offensive coaching, big part of that. Yeah, and, and Ryan Day towards the end of the season was criticized a lot, um, and I think in some ways rightfully so, in some ways maybe not. But he, you know, a lot of screens in the Penn State game. I think we counted there was ten or eleven of those that accounted for maybe ten or eleven yards and. There's a whole discussion about that and about how terrible it was. And then, you know, you get to the Michigan game and obviously Ohio State loses and loses not scoring very many points. Then you get to the Georgia game and Ryan Day was in his bag, man. He was right. the, the play calling of that game. I, I really couldn't complain about much, you know, towards the end of the game. Obviously, we had some calls that didn't go our way, but didn't really feel like it was much on the as much on the play calling as it might have been on the execution of some of those plays. And so, yeah. It, it's I'm having a hard time reconciling in my head. Okay. Ryan day, great play caller when you're playing Maryland, great play caller when you're playing Rutgers. But what does that sort of look like in those bigger games when, you know, teams can do things that other teams could not. Um, positionally, I think that, you know, Fry coming in and coaching the offensive line um, has helped also helps obviously when you have two all American tackles, um, the interior of the offensive right. line struggled a little, little bit more, but um, in terms of play calling and actual coaching points, Again, I'm going to go 
I'll go a little bit higher than the total coaching, maybe go B plus, um, just, you know, rescuing that a little bit towards the end. Um, and the only real bad play calling games to me were Penn state and Michigan. Um, so I end about a B plus. I wish it could be a little bit higher. I think depending on what direction Ohio state goes in next season, we could see that be a little bit higher. Um, depending on if Ryan day gives up play calling duties or if he just calls to the games, like he called the Georgia game. Um, right. So, but that, that's where I ended up for this season. What about you? Um, I, again, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, the Georgia game, I think what we saw, what I at least hope, what I, the, me being optimistic, what we saw was Ryan day learning his lessons from the Michigan loss. I think so. Um, he went a little urban Meyer in the Michigan game What you know, Urban Meyer in big games would have a tendency to just sort of like compact himself, hold his breath. Now, unfortunately, I'm well for Urban Meyer's version of that was just running the hell out of the quarterback. Quarterback. Um, save us JT, as Spikes says. Um, I'm good with day scheming up, but more of the five wide receiver and four wide receiver looks, which did Ohio state really well. And that peach bowl for sure. Going empty a lot. Or right. Um, and I, I, I don't even, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's play calling. Um, so much of the play calling as, as you said, is, is actually the game prep in the week of, um, and, he'll have an opportunity, especially with Heartline. And I think I've mentioned this before. I'm pretty sure that the offensive coordinator job will go to both Fry and Heartline as co-offensive coordinators. I, I don't know why I, f I feel like everyone's just assuming that they're just going to give it to Heartline. I'm like, no, they're probably going to do both. They're both currently coordinators, run game and pass game coordinators. They'll give both of them a well and OC job. And Fry took a demotion to come to Ohio State. I mean, he, you know, he he was calling plays before, and he's he isn't at Ohio State, and so I think this probably was something that was in the works a little bit, anyways, knowing that Kevin Wilson would move on, right? And eventually, Fry could step into that role, and if he wants, if Brian Day wants him to split it with Hartline, great, don't have a problem with that. Is Day's issue that he needs a balanced athletic quarterback like Justin Fields? Well, first and foremost, you don't get a Justin Fields all that often. If you need a Justin Fields. Well, just look at what's happening to Clemson. If if your offense needs a Justin Fields, you're screwed. Um, but no, um, Stroud, not not as athletic as far as like a runner goes as Justin Fields, that, but still very, okay, very right. athletic. Yeah. Um, Ryan Day. And we can uh, we're still talking about the offensive coaching. Did not want CJ Stroud to run. Now, we can talk about that from both good and bad aspects. Did you see the play? We all did. The Marvin Harrison touchdown to the back of the end zone because he Incredible. kept the ball alive. Uh, he kept the play alive, was looking downfield. That sort of development comes from not letting your quarterback run. A lot of lesser quarterbacks would have just tucked that ball and ran. But what did CJ Stroud do? Kept his eyes he up. kept the ball up. He kept his eyes downfield. He gets that touchdown. Yet when C.J. Stroud ran. Yes. And I, I think once again, was there a learned lesson by Ryan Day during the Michigan game of, OK, but during the big games, let your quarterback run. I am all for telling your quarterback, if you are playing Maryland, do, don't run. Don't take hits. Don't do it. Stay healthy. All for that. But if it's a Michigan game. If it's a Georgia game and we did, we saw both planned and improvised runs during the Georgia game. Yeah. You, you, you need to run. You need to let your quarterback run when you are at a even, or at least somewhat even talent level as your opponent. Uh, so I will criticize Ryan day for that um, in, in that, but not as much as most people would. Cause I, I do, I think he needs to balance that. It's not don't run your quarterback. It's when you run your quarterback. All right. Uh, you gave a grade. I forget what you said. Did you say B plus? I said B plus. Yeah. Um, one thing that I want to mention as you're putting that in as well, that I thought was interesting, just looking forward a little bit. 
um, to next season is, uh, and I think Sorry, obviously having, back having the having the month to prepare obviously makes a huge difference. Um, but we did see a lot of things in the Peach Bowl that we didn't really necessarily see as much uh, throughout the regular season. Um, mostly, like um, Gangland was saying in chat, those empty looks, uh, as well as Ohio State had a lot of times, even when they were near midfield, where they went double tight, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, they had Royer in there. They uh, had Rossi in there. And so, you know, obviously you're going to do that a little bit more whenever you have some of your most talented best wide receivers out. But I think Ohio State also saw the matchup with those tight ends. Um, and it worked out pretty well for them. So um, just just something to look for uh, moving forward a little bit. For well, and they, they just needed the extra blockers because Absolutely. George's defensive line was so good. Yeah. Um, but again, maybe they should have done that more against Michigan, to your point. All right. Quarterbacks. High, high, high expectations for CJ Stroud coming into the year. Um, I personally don't have anything negative to say about CJ Stroud. I really don't think I do either. It's, you know, obviously it's, it's tough because he's going to, his legacy is going to go down as the fact that he never beat Michigan. And I mean, it, and it needs to be, be said that he played great in both of the Michigan games. And it, it maybe necessarily shouldn't be his legacy, but it, and hopefully it shouldn't it's not, be. It's hopefully it's not the only thing that people talk about. I mean, and again, looking back at the Peach Bowl, well, you, he had probably the best, if not one of the best games of his career in the Peach Bowl. I mean, against a the best defense he has played probably in his whole career. Uh, and he played the best game that he possibly could have. I don't think there's anything he could have really done differently um, there at the end. And it's not like he played all season terribly either. I mean, he keep in mind, this is a guy that was a Heisman finalist. Like he, he was a great player. Obviously, it helps that he's placed quarterback for Ohio State. But he was awesome this season. He was, and I, I hope that people don't just remember him as the guy that lost to Michigan twice and then, you know, didn't get Ohio State to win in the playoffs because that's not really fair whenever you look at the talent and look at the things that he did. I mean, I, I, I saw a, a statistic where um, Dwayne Haskins broke the efficiency record for, at quarterback for Ohio State, and since then, Justin Fields broke it, and then this season, C.J. Stroud broke it again. So C.J. Stroud holds the record for being the most efficient Ohio State quarterback ever. We've right. had some guys come through the program, so I, I hope people that's I hope that's not what people remember him for. Um, and just I, just to de- redefend, because I feel like defending Ryan Day has been my whole thing since the Michigan loss. That's because of Ryan Day. Yeah, the quarterback. We didn't get sure. we did not one get that level of talent at quarterback before Ryan Day, and two didn't develop it like Ryan Day developed it. Because in case anyone out there needs to hear this. He was the quarterback coach and offensive coordinator for Haskins. He wasn't the head coach yet, but he was the quarterback coach and offensive coordinator for Haskins. And and I think people are going to see a lot more, especially if Kyle McCord wins the job this year, because Kyle McCord has been in Ryan Day's program for two years, and he'll be the first quarterback to be going into their third year and starting at Ohio State in Ryan Day's program. So I think there's a chance that you see a really special common court, but as far as that's a very good year, point. Um, as far as CJ Stroud this year, I, I wish I could give him an a plus. I think he was really good. His expectations were obviously high, but I'm going to give him still a flat a, cause I think he was still fantastic. I wish I could give him that little bit more, but those, those last two losses to end the season, unfortunately, you're going to stymie that a little bit. I'm going full a plus. I, I just don't blame him Fair. for the losses. I just, he played wow. excellently in that in both of the Michigan losses, the Georgia loss. And by the way, because I know everyone likes to talk about, you know, JSN's performance in the Rose Bowl. Well, someone was throwing him that ball. And while he was throwing him that ball, he also threw three touchdowns to Marvin Harrison Jr. and Marvin Harrison Jr.'s first start. Seems like the guy's probably pretty good then. He's pretty good. And I know that was actually last year, but I'm just, yeah, still. Um, Running backs. This is, this is, this is difficult. This one. Yeah, it, it almost feels like it's dumb to grade this because it like like an incomplete. It does, because like. As you pointed out when we were talking about the coaching, they didn't have their three best running backs at the end. They did. They had to move a linebacker and a wide receiver. Who, who both, both played pretty good, to be fair. <laughs> who, well, and, and both had running back experience, to be fair. 
but they had a wide receiver and a linebacker playing running back this year and a true freshman playing running back this year in a and no offense to Hayden because he when called upon he did great he did but there's not. not a soul on the planet that was giving him more than 20 carries for the entire season had you asked them in August he he wasn't a Trevion Henderson coming into the season as the oh that's that's that dude that is the guy he he wasn't someone you know he was still the fourth running back on the depth chart at best so right it's well, he was the fourth running back on the depth chart because they only had four scholarship running backs on the depth chart. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so unless we're counting Steel Chambers. Um, he, he always counts as a running back in my heart, but I, I think we do still have to assign a grade. Um, and I think we're allowed to consider the injuries in this grade. I am still I'm still going to go C minus. Um, I honestly wanted to kind of go in the D, D plus territory, but the injuries made me go up a little bit higher. I wish that it could be better. And part of it is, and we'll get to the offensive line, but part of it's that this offensive line was a much better pass blocking unit than it was a run blocking unit, um, at, at least in my opinion. So th that makes it a little even tougher, especially with guys all being out, you know. I mean, I, I don't know how many guys got carries at running back for Ohio State this year, but it, I'm, I'm sure it's – the most in a very long time, maybe been seven, eight, nine guys. Um, so I, I went on like a tear through the statistics. I did it in the discord. I never brought it up on the podcast itself. The last time Ohio State. So if you just go by carries, mm -hmm. the most carries that the third running back got. So just number one in carries, number two in carries, number three in carries. I had to go back to the 80s to find out yeah. the last time right. a third string, the third, the running back with the third most carries had as many carries as Hayden had this year. Yeah. And again, I mean, none of this even counts prior. Who's who was actually probably, I mean, and, and obviously Ohio State was talking a little bit about him being more of a gadget, um, thinking more of like a Jalen Marshall third. type guy. But he was still going to be or, or at least a third round or excuse me, not a third round, a third down running back. Something right. He, he yeah. was going to be he was going to play, whether that be in the slot or whether that be in the backfield. So didn't we have an Austin over there. under for this stat? I mean, probably, but I'm not going to ask Austin to look that up in real looked, time. Yeah, I looked at them all the other day and I'm sure there was one on there, but. I don't think we all we always ran plays to our strengths uh if by our strength you mean the left side correct yeah we they probably should have favored the left side a little bit more but then but then you the have that, that as too. a yeah exactly or just block scheme yeah i mean it was i don't know Did the injuries see? made it tough i'm i'll just go with a c as well um but honestly it all it just doesn't even feel fair to no to grade the running backs um, offensive line, the, um, again, grading based off of expectation, they only had one person returning to the spot that they started. Is that right? No, that's not both right. Of, both of the tackles were back, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, both of the tackles were back. Um, how many sacks did we give up on the year? 10, 11? I, I want to say 11 or 12 because I think they had three or four in the, Georgia game. And I think we went into that game with eight. That, feels that sounds right. about that right. That's that's in yeah. the it's that's in the Ballpark. area of correct. Um, they were an excellent pass blocking uh, units all year. Run blocking got tough when they played the bigger like corn, like corn fed Big Ten teams. They had trouble running against Iowa. They had trouble running against um, Michigan. Uh, they had they did, basically didn't even try to run, at least not like in a proper sense. Most of their most of their running that was successful against Georgia, you had two running backs over four and a half per carry. It wasn't bad, it was but the outside, <laughs> it was to the outside. And it was after they were making hay through the pass game and forcing Georgia to back up. Um but we also didn't necessarily have huge expectations for the offensive line coming in. I think we knew the interior was going to be a bit patchwork. And uh, so, I mean, 
I want to give them like a because I think I think they met expectations. Um, because I don't know that we expected the interior of the line to be great. And we did expect the tackles to be great, but in all fairness, I think they were. Um, and I, you know, if we were grading the tackles differently from the interior of the offensive line, I mean, the tackles would be getting a better grade for sure. Um, but yeah, the, uh, I, I kind of want to just say I didn't have a ton of expectation coming into the year. I think they basically met my expectations. They did not surpass them. They did not necessarily disappoint them. I think it kind of just makes it a solid B in my head. Yeah, I was, I'm there about, um, I think that, as I said earlier, the, the pass blocking was very good. The run blocking left a little bit to be desired, but I mean, that's going to happen when you've got a true sophomore at guard, you've got a fifth or sixth year starter at the other guard who, you know, if you're a fifth or sixth year starter at Ohio state, that means you didn't get on the field for those other years for a reason, not to say that he was completely terrible, but you know, it took him that long to get on the field. At that point, you're bigger, stronger than faster than everyone else. So, and then you got Whippler who was, you know, there at center and kind of got thrown in last year. So yeah, the interior really struggled running the ball. I think they will be much better next year. Um, Obviously, we don't know if Whipler's coming back yet. We assume that he probably is, but if he goes to the NFL, it wouldn't super surprise me. Matt Jones is gone. Donovan Jackson has to come back. So there, Matt there Jones, the by the way, not necessarily gone. Like, he does have the COVID year, which COVID year. I mean, that's I, I don't like to guess on all that because yeah, 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 knows, yeah, yeah. Who knows what's gonna happen? And if he does come back, I mean, I'll, I'll welcome him back. You know, I mean, another year of experience, and he's an older guy, and but you know took some time for him to acclimate um, Donovan Jackson. There's a world where he's the only offensive lineman that comes back next year. I hope that's not the case because I, I do like our offensive line. I think that right. they can improve a little bit, but um, for the most part, I thought they were pretty good. Uh, if they can grow a little bit and, and have to, um, you know, some down blocks on running the ball. And obviously I think it helps a lot running the ball when you have running backs that are healthy. So uh, right. they'll play a big role in it. So I, I think I'll go a little bit higher than you. I'll go B plus um, would love for that to be an A or an A plus next year. For what it's worth, I do think I'm pretty sure Whipler's going to come back. Pretty um, sure as well. And it should be stated that while Donovan Jackson will be back, he might not be a left guard. He, they might balance him out to tackle. But uh, if you guys want more prognosticating on that, uh, Tony Gerdeman will be guesting on the show on Monday. Um, and we're going to go through a depth chart projection with uh, Mr. Tony. All right, goat. Tony the goat, guys. Can I get some Tony emotes in the chat? That would be appreciated. I know we got them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We we got we got the Tony emotes. Wide right. receivers, huge expectations coming into the year. Um, now of course JSN, for all intents and purposes, never played. No. We'll just say JSN was out for the entire year. Um, I. This so it becomes a little bit hard to to judge it. And again, because this is the if we go by pure recruiting numbers. Uh, along with quarterback, the best room in the. It's probably the best uh, defensive room ends. Is, the well, I'm only hesitating because of the defensive ends. There's a lot of five stars there as well. But yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think Ohio State has maybe five five-star receivers in the room right now which is absurd i believe that that's accurate depending on the site that you look at of course but i it's either i mean it's four or five it's 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 quite a lot um so and like you said it's, it's also difficult whenever jsn's out but i think if you look at what egbuka did he was expected to be the third wide receiver and he stepped into that wide receiver two role played fantastic did you know, he wasn't the go-to guy like Marv was, but he, you know, was still steady, had a really good season. Marvin Harrison Jr., I think, you know, we, he had high expectations too, but blew those expectations out of the water, in my opinion. I had incredibly high expectations for Marv, uh, and he destroyed those expectations. Exactly. Yeah, he, so, he took my expectations and took them down a few rungs and climbed over them, rubbed his feet on my expectations, and then kept early. running. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, and he, and he did, it's not like he just, you know, exploded near the end of the season or, or did something along those lines. And that's where I was um, just heading to was that Fleming showed flashes of what he could be. He, especially more towards the end of the season. I mean, he had, I think he had the yips to be honest in those middle games. I mean, he, yeah. he dropped quite a few passes and, right. you know, coming out of high school in that class, I think he was in that 2019 class, if I remember correctly, if not, he was maybe 2020, something like that. Um, but coming out of that class, you could have made an argument that Fleming was the highest rated or best receiver in that class. You know? I, I mean, depending you upon which argument. site you looked at, he was the number one player in the class period. Like I think ESPN had him one, one. Yeah. Uh, ESPN's rankings are garbage, but yeah, important piece here is that he was at least according to somebody, the best player in the class period. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously you don't expect someone like that to have all the drops and everything that he did, but towards the end of the season, he, he turned it on a little bit. And I mean, he's got the body frame, he's got the style that, you know, for, for a nice position wide receiver. And I mean, in the peach bowl, he had an awesome game, um, yeah. especially, you know, whenever, even when Marvin Harrison was in, you know, as the third receiver, which if they all come back, he's going to be the third receiver again next year. Right. And, you know, having a guy with Fleming's talent, JF4, as the third receiver on your team, you know, Marvin Harrison and Nick Booker are going to get a lot of coverage uh, next season. And so if, if Fleming can step up a little bit, not have the, some of those drops, right. I think he's he's in for a really, really good season. And so beyond I think it's him, very I've, valuable to have had the yips and gotten over the yips. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think that that's going to be valuable for him going into next season. But beyond him this year. I think the wide receivers as high expectation as I had them and considering the fact JSN was hurt, I, I'm going to give the wide receivers an A plus. I, I don't think that there's much else that they could have really done um, barring JSN not getting hurt, which isn't his fault. And so I, I don't know. I mean, our, our wide receiver room is the best it's probably ever been at Ohio state and maybe ever will be. I hope not. I hope we keep recruiting at this level, but I mean, the five stars just keep coming in and, Right. Every season, the wide receivers just keep blowing the expectations out of the water. And so, yeah, I don't think that I could have asked much more from them this year. Uh, I am going to go with uh, actually uh, an A minus. Um, I think they disappeared against Michigan. I think they disappeared in a couple other games where, you know, again, I, and I say this because we're grading based off of expectation and the expectations were up here. Um, so I think in the same way that like you didn't quite give the full A plus to CJ Stroud because the expectations were so high, it's kind of where I'm at with the wide receivers. I think there were, sure. there were moments this year where it felt like Marvin Harrison Jr. was the only one getting open. And when you have a room filled with five-star guys, I don't think that should ever be the case. Um, but again, I'm grading them on an incredibly tough curve because that's the expectation for them. Absolutely. And I mean, right. still being in that, that A category is still, you yeah, have sure. a great season. So, sure. Yeah. All right. We've got tight ends, Jared. It is the year of the tight end. Of Was course. it? No. 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 Next year, though. Next rule year. Number, rule number 13. I don't even have to look is, that one up. Is it 13? Of course it is. That feels fitting. Yeah. Yeah. Did you engineer it that way? I did not. It was organic, which is incredible. Yes. Austin is our um, lore master, I suppose, would be the title. He keeps the list of our rules. Um, tight ends. Let's do this one quickly so we can maybe get back on track time-wise. Sure. Um, I didn't have a ton. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> it was probably it was a good, good time to do it. Um, I didn't have a ton of expectations coming in. Um, and there were moments in which I was pleasantly surprised. And there were moments in which I was disappointed. I sort of wanted Cade Sover to be the blocking tight end and he ended up being a little bit more of a receiving tight end. Um, he did pretty good with it. He did fine with it. Um, I think I'm just going to go with like a B here. I didn't have a ton of expectations and the expect the sort of what I got back from those expectations was not being either impressed or disappointed. So I just feel like this is like, Middle of the road expectations, middle of the road production. I feel, I feel good just like giving them a B and moving on. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with everything you said. I'm going to give them a B minus. I mean, just 
basically roll back everything you just said. Uh, I do think that Cape Stover was a lot better at the beginning of the season. I don't know if that's a wear and tear on the body type thing. Um, you know, Rossi is awesome. Love Rossi. Uh, Royer came in towards the end of the season. G Scott finally got a touchdown. So, yeah, uh, I mean, it was it was a decent. He fell off. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Gangland called him Farmer Gronk, which is incredible, of course. Yeah, um, I don't know if it's and, accurate, but it's funny. Yeah, which is all that really matters here. Right. So, um, but yeah, I'll go, I'll go B minus. They they were fine. Uh, seemed he was pretty actually, banged up the second half of the year. Yeah. Well, that's see, that's the like. thing. Like. If you, as a season as a whole, it's almost fair to just say that Ohio State peaked too early, it felt like. And I think a lot of that has to do with injuries. Yeah, absolutely. Defensive coaching. You go first because I need time to <laughs> gather my thoughts and speak eloquently. I have two conflicting thoughts here. Yep. Um, and I said we have to both think with our August brain and our January brain, right? We need to remember. So my first thought is we need to remember how absolute shit this defense was last year. And it was it was pretty shit. We, we need to remember that. So we need to remember the progress that was made in a single offseason. So that's me. That's that's my August brain giving an incredibly favorable but then these last, you know, the last two games, it's over eight yards allowed per snap, um, a ton of points allowed. But also, these were two of the best offensive lines that Ohio State has maybe ever played. Like the George offensive line yeah, sure. is amazing. That Michigan offensive line won the uh, whatever that Joe one Moore. Is, is yeah, that right? right? Joe Moore. Yes. Um yeah. One to joke two years in a row. Um, that again, like I, I, I called Ohio State fans narcissists a few episodes back for thinking everything had to do with them, and maybe the reason we lost to Michigan had to do more with Michigan than it had to do with us. Again, like that offensive line's insane. Um, and the Georgia offensive line was also excellent, and like you can point to the Georgia game and the yards given up. And you can point at that Georgia game and talk about the points given up. But you know what I saw in that game was an excellent cat and mouse. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about the momentum shifts in that game. Well, it's because the defensive and offensive coordinators were constantly readjusting and adapting to each other. And we have to remember, again, we have to remember expectation, what we were thinking, all of that. We never saw adjustments from last year's defense ever. And what we saw in that, no. in that cotton bowl, excuse me, in the peach bowl was coordinators constantly adjusting to each other constantly with the X's and O cat and mouse game. Um, I think you saw excellent coordinators on both th sides of the football on both sides of the field constantly battling it out with adjustments. And I know it's probably going to be controversial because again, the last two games, we have to think of the game as we have to think of the season as a whole. And we have to remember how absolute shit this defense was schematically the previous two seasons. So again, I'm going to get shit for this. I don't care. A plus. Ooh, Jared. That, uh, yeah. Oh, mm. I, I respect it. I understand where you're coming from, and I don't necessarily even disagree with your points. However, we're paying Jim Knowles. Well, not we. I don't work for Ohio State, but you get what I mean. I pay but taxes in this state. Basically, you're paying Jim Knowles' salary. <laughs> no, I'm not. The, the athletic department the pays for itself. Paying. Yeah, yeah. But regardless of all that, Jim Knowles is being paid $2 million to coach this defense. Now, yeah. if you remember, a big reason why Ohio State had to get a new defensive coordinator, and they were going to anyways by the end of the season, but they gave up 
40 some odd points to Michigan at the end of the season last year. And someone, everyone was saying, we need to bring in someone to fix this scheme for whenever we play Michigan next year. This can't happen again. Understandable take. Totally sure. get it. Jim, Ohio State has the type of offense where they can win shootouts. Like they, they are going to win shootouts 90% of the time. Obviously, they were in a shootout with Georgia. They end up losing that game. But, you know, if they're, if it is a, if both teams are, are in the 40 point range, I would take Ohio State to win that game almost all the time, right? Jim Knowles wasn't brought in necessarily to hold Rutgers to zero points, to hold Maryland to 10 points, to hold, you know, Purdue to 20 points. Jim Knowles was brought in to stop the Michigan running offense to, and, and I think the, the quote that gets me is that Jim Knowles says that he bakes five big plays into his defense. And I hate that because five big plays can turn into 35 points. You're not going to win some football games like that. And obviously, you know, he's speaking a little tongue in cheek there. It's not necessarily always going to be touchdowns or not always going to be big plays, but like, and, and I know that his, he's not necessarily trying to give those plays up, but it's like, man, can we try and scheme for no big plays? And, and, and part of that is the players that you have on the field. And some of those guys weren't necessarily as good as we wanted them to be or as good as they should have been. Um, some of the specific, specifically the corners, I would say, underperformed, and we'll get to them. But I need Jim Knowles to come back next year. And I, I don't I, – speaking from the heart here, and I might get some shit for this too – I don't care how he does the first 11 games of the season. I don't care how many points we give up. I don't care how close the games are. If we don't stop Michigan's running game, no matter who their coach is, no matter who their quarterback is, no matter who their running back is, I don't care. Spike says the idea is that by that he's talking about the giving up X number of big plays a game. The idea, though, is that it buys you three or four three and outs, which keeps the offense out on the field. I, I totally get it. We, I, This is a thing, and if you guys want to hear me go about this in a little bit more detail, you can go listen to the Scarlet and Gray Peach Bowl edition. There are consequences. No matter what you do, there are consequences. Sure. If you want a defense that is aggressive, that blitzes, that fills gaps, that creates pressure, you're going to give up big plays. You're either playing... And of course, like you should always be mixing these things up, of course, but generally speaking, you're either playing aggressive, forcing three and outs, or you're playing a shell doing bend, but don't break, giving up a ton of first downs, a ton of yards, basically handing the other team field goals at times. But wouldn't you have bought that whenever it came to the Michigan game that, that I feel like Knowles shouldn't necessarily be putting Ohio State in the position that he did. Ever like that shouldn't be the game plan every week. Like when you're playing a team like Michigan, let them run the ball down the field, kick a field goal. That's fine. When you're letting them get 80 yard touchdown passes, whenever JJ McCarthy is their quarterback and he's you know under throwing his receive. Like I mean, in, in that game against Ohio State, it's not like he was throwing pinpoint passes. He was throwing passes to wide open guys. You know, right. and, and and so I. I know you're on the A plus side of it. I I need more from him next year. And I'm not saying he was bad. I appreciate him getting Ohio State's defense statistically better, but it doesn't matter if you don't win the big games. Um, so it also needs go... to be noted that he hasn't been on the job for a full year yet. Yeah, absolutely, and and all of that can be taken into account. But at the same time, you know, it took him three or four years to get Oklahoma State in check. This isn't Oklahoma State. This is big boy football. This is Ohio State, and that also has to be taken into account. So. I'm, I think last year I, we gave the defense an F. So all things considered, the C that I'm going to give them is actually pretty good. Uh, uh, okay. Well, I, I would love to argue more with you about this, but we, we do need to move on. This is going to sure. be a long episode. Um, yeah. Defensive ends. Um, I, the defensive ends, I felt like were disruptive all season, even when it didn't statistically show it. Yep. Um, but like with the wide receivers, like with the quarterback, we, we expect that we expect that. Like you, you have, man, it, all, it almost even feels disrespectful to the defensive ends to call them five stars. Yeah. Like it all, it all, 
Harrison, JT, Sawyer. I don't know if they all star five stars. Right. Those were I don't know if they all finished in the top 10. I think Sawyer may have fell fell out, but those were all top JT did. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, those were all at least at one point top 10 recruits. Not the position. (laughs) But regardless of position. (laughs) Right. And by the way, that's not even counting like Javante Jean Baptiste, who was a high four star. Um, anyway, I thought they were incredibly disruptive for a lot this year. Um, don't feel like they were always as effective as I would have want them to have been against the running game. Um, but I think, I don't think that was their job. I think their job was to more occupy blocks in the running game and allow the linebackers to get the tackles, which worked for the most part. Um, Again, I, they probably deserve an A plus, but again, going off of expectation, I'm gonna bump them down to an A because, like I said, just expectation. We expected them to be amazing. Well, Jared, I think this will be the quickest one because I also want to give them an A. They, based on the scheme, did everything that was asked of them. They, you know, I think we're so used to seeing our defensive ends get sack numbers, and we're thinking Chase Young, and we're thinking both of the Boses, but that and, and these guys are one of the up. Boses, if we're being honest. Sure. And that's not even shade towards younger Bosa. It's just he was injured a lot. Yeah. But, you know, we're we're thinking of those sack numbers and those type of things. And I, it was a very different defense than than this defense. I think this defense is built for that bullet position and those linebackers to get the sacks and to get the tackles on blitzes and things like that. And so not to say they didn't get some. They did. I mean, JT2 and Moloal had one of the best games a player has ever had in college football history. So, I, right. you know. But based on the scheme and the things that they were asked to do, give them an A. All right. Um, Defensive tackles. Um, Not going to be nearly as nice here. I had very high expectations. Um, I I don't want to call anyone out by name, but there were certain players who we expected to be disruptors. Um. And they showed flashes of being disruptors, but those flashes were too few and far between. Um, And again, in games like Georgia and Michigan, um, where they had to face like real. And by the way, even like not not even Georgia and Michigan, like Iowa, Iowa, where they had to face like grown men at you know interior offensive linemen they struggled um gangland says we need more consistency on the inside and i think that's exactly what it is also size i think if you look at the defensive tackles that ohio state's been starting for the past years they're not small per se but the type of player we've been recruiting at that position is a little bit more of an athletic defensive tackle you know you, you don't necessarily see the 300 pound you know 310 pound guys that we do have like, 300 pound guys, but, but 300, 300 doesn't mean what it used to mean. If we're no. just, yeah, it's, it's more athleticism than it is guys that are going to go like, I mean, and Jalen Carter is not a fair example because that man is inhuman, but right. he's athletic and also just huge. And I think if Ohio state could have someone who's maybe half as athletic as that, but still that size eating up rocks right. on the inside, that would help a lot. And we didn't have that this year. And that's, that's a big part of why the defense wasn't necessarily as good against the run as it could have been, especially late in the season. Yeah. So I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I think C plus here. Um, yeah, I was going to go flat C. So we're, we're pretty close. Yeah. Linebackers based off of expectations. Remember that the linebackers at Ohio state, and I'm going to say this very, very (laughs) carefully performed. I don't want to say that the linebackers were shit because we've seen Pete Warner go into the NFL and do amazing things. He's He's way uh, better as a pro than he ever was at Ohio State, which just proves that the issues were schematic and yada, 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 yada. So I don't want to say that the linebackers as individuals at Ohio State have been shit for several years. Again, wouldn't be very careful the way I say this. I'm talking the way they have performed due to schematics have been shit at Ohio state 
for a very long time. A very long time. And they were one of the strengths of the defense this year. I I, I want to give them two pluses. It's like an A plus yeah. plus. I, I'm not I was going obviously, to. But. I was obviously notoriously critical of um, Tommy Eichenberg. Um, for the longest time, calling him Tommy Ike in Borland, which is still one of my favorite things to just say. It just rolls off the tongue. Um, but but it's also a little racist, if we're being honest. <laughs> I've got to put my foot. I've got to put my foot in my mouth. He he proved me wrong. He had uh, at least in the past ten or so years one of the best linebacker seasons at Ohio State. I mean, he was all over the field. I, I still don't want him in coverage. I think we saw that a little bit in the Georgia game. And by the way, that coverage still Disagree. wasn't completely terrible. It was, it was actually one of the fastest he was, he was up against one of the, first off, it was a zone. It wasn't a man. So when people were thinking like, oh, this is just like the Alabama. No, it wasn't because it was a zone coverage, not a man coverage. And two, Eichenberg was close enough to at least make the tackle. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was pretty, (laughs) it was a pretty good throw. You can't even blame him on that one. But regardless, if you look at the whole season, Eichenberg played great. Steel Chambers played great. And I think the biggest part of it is that it was the consistency, man. Like those guys were on the field almost every defensive down we had this season. I mean, they did not come off the field and they, I think they averaged uh, like 18 tackles combined between the two of them every game. That's it, look at the numbers last year. I bet you that some of the linebacker games don't even come up to half of that. And and that's, that's crazy to think about. And, you know, they were both playing at an all American level. I mean, you've got the leadership. I think we all saw the seal chambers, uh, press conference after the Peach Bowl. He's going to come back next year. Maybe get the block O. He would probably be my my bet for right now. Maybe we see Eichenberg come back. And even if we even if we don't see these guys come back, man, they were they were some studs this year. And and you mentioned it, but I think that they were the best part of the defense this year, which is a complete 180 flip from being the worst part of the defense almost without debate last year. And I so, would still say the defensive ends were the best part of the defense, but the fact that it's even a conversation yeah, is, an, is insane. Absolutely. I, and yeah, so I, I go a plus as well. I, I can't take anything away from them. Eichenberg and steel chambers were both fantastic this year. By the way, Cody Simon played a decent amount and was also and well. good when he came in. Oh yeah, he was good. And he's, he's, I mean, he'll get some, probably some more playing time next year, regardless of whether one comes back and, you know, we'll see, we'll see how he does. I, I don't, I don't like to talk about transfers, but I'm only going to say this because I like Cody Simon so much. So I said, so this is a compliment. So I'm willing to break my don't talk, don't transfer players on their behalf don't speculate about transfers i'm willing to break this rule right now because it's a compliment if you see both steel and eichenberg come back i I have to think simon hits the transfer portal because he's just good enough to start at most places not even most places i think almost all places i mean he's he's a linebacker Yeah. yeah uh corners this one's difficult is it yeah because i think that they were inconsistent i think there were times in which they played well there were times in which they did not play well it's hard to grade them as a whole on the entire season because again there were times in which they played well and because i think people like the safety so much because we saw the safeties make a lot of plays. So we like the safeties. We would kind of blame the corners when there would be breakdowns in the passing game. Mm -hmm. But if you go back and watch, it's not true. It's very frequently the safeties giving up big plays in the passing game. Um, We saw, first off, they they also had injury issues from the get-go. That that needs to be discussed much. So that's another reason why it's like the run, not as much as the running backs, but kind of like the running backs. It's difficult to grade them. It's gr- difficult to grade the corners because there were a lot of injuries. Um, I thought Burke, Burke struggled early. I, I don't, much so. but he corrected it. Absolutely. Um, Cam Brown had 
a year in which he was good at times, but also not very good at times. And then he turned around and had a great game against Georgia, um, which, by the way, makes me feel good about the coaching. Just going to toss that out mm. there. We saw corners, the same corners, improve as the year went on, which gives me a lot of hope for the corners next year, even if it's even if it's not the same guys. I mean, Burke will be back at the very least, but it's, it, it indicates to me that there is development taking place because both of the secondary coaches, the corner and safety coach also are brand new. They haven't been on the roster. They haven't been on the staff for a full year. Um, Would you I, say that safety is getting caught in a misstep, allowed the cornerbacks to get beat over the top? Question from the chat. Um, sometimes, but not always. That I mean, I, I, I can't, I can't answer that as a total yes or total no. I think that happened, but I don't think it happened as a rule. I don't think, you know what I'm saying? Like, yes, that happened, but it didn't happen so regularly that I'm willing just to say yes to that either. Yeah, um, I, I think for the corners, they they played opposite to their competition for me most of the year. If they were playing a really good receiving core, really good offense, I think that they've had their worst games of the year at those points. And part of that's got to be credit to the offense. Part of it's got to be, and I think this is a big part of it, is a confidence thing. I think that a lot of our corners had a rough start to the season and they lost their confidence. I think corner is one of those positions where you've got to have some swagger, man, because playing corner is tough. Playing yeah. corner is one of the toughest. I mean, I would say obviously quarterback's the hardest position to play in football, but corner might be number two. There's at least an argument for it being there. And I mean, you've got to be right there on a guy. And in order to do that, you've got to be confident. And a lot of our corners were, were not confident uh, at many points in the season. So it's, it's that on, and that paired with the it should be noted that, how young the corners are. You talk oh, yeah. about you talk about having that confidence and being able to maintain composure with the exception of Cam Brown. The corners are exceptionally young. And, and I think that what would have helped them a lot, at least in my eyes. In terms of a, you know, view, how we view their season, a lot of the t things that hurt them from our eyes were that. All the big plays we gave up, not, not all of them, but a, a good majority of them were because a corner either ran the wrong coverage or just fell. And if those things, you know, and, th and those things are going to happen every so often, but if, man, it felt like it happened once every couple games or so. I mean, sometimes it was the safeties falling, not the corners. Oh, sure, sure. It could have been any of, the, any of the DBs, but I mean, the corners were definitely, you know, it definitely happened to them once or twice at the very least. And it's like, man, if you just stay on your feet and you stay within two feet of the guy, it's going to make a catch a lot harder for him. And so that that's my big challenge for the corners next year is, man, just, just stay close enough to be in a position to make the play. If you don't make the play and you're close enough to the guy where the quarterback had to make a good throw, I can't even fault you for that. That's just the offense making a good play. But I need you to be in position to try and make a play. This is a note for the coaches, not the players. And I think in all of college football, you got to – I know it's like, oh, no, we don't they don't turn their heads because they play the hands. They play the hands. We teach them to play the hands. But guess what? If J.J. McCarthy's throwing up an arm punt and the ball's floating and the ball's short, if they're playing the hands, they're going to run straight into the wide receiver. And it's a defensive yeah. pass interference when in any other situation in the NFL. Where the where they do have the corners turn their heads. That arm punt, that floating ball puts the way. defensive player in position to pick that ball off. Um, I don't know how many times I saw. I feel like that happened an exceptional number of times to Ohio State this year, Absolutely. whether it was against Penn State or Michigan, especially the number of DPIs simply from that, that head. alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's not the player's fault. That's how they're coached. But that's that's got to change because you you those arm punts just lead to 15 yard penalties way too frequently. But we need to we need to do this grade. Um, I'm going to do like a I'm between like a B minus and a C plus. What do you think? 
Um, I'm going to go C minus. That was between a C and a C minus. So I'll, I, I, I just really want to see them not fall and just get a little bit of their swagger back. And I, and you know, I'll, I'll, I want to mention. I mean, I, I'm sure any self-respecting Ohio State fan knows this. These aren't grades saying that our players are terrible. These are, you know, some of the best players in the country, and I love them, and I hope that they're fantastic next year. But man, some little things just need to be improved. That's all. How do you uh, expect to force turnovers if they don't play the ball? They don't. That's the that's the issue. Yeah. Safeties. We I had incredibly high expectations yeah. for the safeties, and we saw exceptional play from the safeties at times this year. But man, we also saw just some unacceptable play from the safeties at times this year as well. Um, it's like the corners, but to further extremes. Let and for that, what. and for what it's worth, had higher expect had much higher expectations for the safeties this year than I had for the corners. Let me tell you where I'm at grade wise, and you tell me if this makes if it feels like it makes sense to you. It I am right between a C plus and a B minus, but it feels like the difference between those two grades is massive based on what the safeties did this season. Like, I feel like if I give them a C plus, it's sort of saying you guys way underperformed and didn't do the best job. And if I give them a B minus, it's like kind of giving them a pass for some of the things that they did in my head. Right. Um, that being said, I'm going to give them a C plus. Cause they, like you said, the, the expectations were higher than it was for the corners. A lot of the corners are a little bit younger um, and not as an experience as experienced. And, you know, the safeties, Lathan Ransom, Ronnie Rocket Hickman, Tanner McAllister. Like we were, these are guys that have been Proctor. Maybe not necessarily in a Proctor. Yeah. Guys that either have been in the program for a while or for McAllister, like been playing college football for a while. And you talked me out of my plus. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, they're older. Like you, you guys are experienced and, and you, I know you had to go and swap into a different system. But this system should have made it easier for you because we were getting a lot more pressure. Our linebackers were playing a lot better. This, this should have made your life easier and it didn't. So uh, McAllister should not have stayed a Cowboy. All things considered, McAllister actually played pretty good this season. He's actually one of the brighter spots for the safeties, I think. Um, he did have one or two plays where he got beat, but, you know, everybody has that. I think McAllister had the most – I think he led the team in interceptions, which we didn't force a lot, but still. Yeah. Um, for a team that was up as much as they were um, and therefore – had the ball passed against them as much as they did. Ohio State should have had more interceptions this year. Um, but again, you gotta you gotta teach the kids to turn their heads. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on special teams. Um I'm largely unimpressed with the special teams this year. Um I didn't see anything exceptional from a kick return, punt return, punt coverage. Um punt or kickoff coverage um nothing exceptional there um i think we do have an excellent punter i that's that's worth noting um i don't know why ohio state has a special teams coach if Mm. the special teams is gonna be this bad (laughs) Not even bad. I don't even say that they're they're unimpressive. There's no preparation. It seems like that has gone into, I mean, even the fake that they ran, there were 12 men on the field. It wouldn't have counted anyways. It's like, if they'd have caught it, if they'd have caught it, but you've, I mean, you've got a special teams coordinator. That means I'm I'm like, and we've, you know, mentioned it. Like what other roles is he filling in? Is he a great recruiter? Is he, you know, helping out around with other positions, you know, whatever it might be. If he's not doing all those other things and it's literally he's just the special teams coordinator, then what are you what do you have him for? Because he's not fulfilling the duties that you need him to fulfill. Because the special if if his sole focus is special teams, and this is how bad the special teams are, and, and again, this is grading based on expectations and things like that, but maybe not even bad is not the right word, but like definitely unimpressive. And so um I also just want to take a slight moment to mention, like I know you talked about Mirko. Um if you're hating on Noah Ruggles, um, right. go to hell. Yeah. Uh, go, yeah. Go fuck yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Go fuck yourself because that guy poured his all into the program. He missed one field goal. And 
it happens. You know, you, you go out there and try and kick a 50 yarder with the game on the line to go to the national championship, let alone just kick a 50 yarder in general. Okay. For so. for what it's for what it's worth, I think it was either Ruggles or Ruggles' mom actually put out a statement thanking Ohio State's fans for support. Like mm-hmm. it most of the time when you hear something like that, it's God, we've been getting death threats. And I'm not I'm not saying Ohio State fans are above that or that even that Ohio State fans are in any way exceptionally kind <laughs> or understanding because I, I know that they aren't. Um, but it was nice to see the family come out and say something positive, I guess. Yeah, um, I'm sure a lot of people were nice to I just. If, yeah. If, 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 I mean, just don't be that person. That's you don't know. I, um, I, we don't i don't know we don't have this as a rule we might need to fix this we haven't said this as much as we used to don't tweet at players Ooh, don't tweet at players there. don't recruits players positive or negative don't 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 misunderstand what i'm saying i'm not saying don't throw shade at players i'm not saying don't be mean to players i'm saying leave them the fuck alone mm. good or bad don't tweet at players. Well, number 15. It's in the book. Don't tag them. Yeah, I mean, go on Twitter and say what you want to say. But if you're thinking to yourself, no, I want to make sure they see this. <laughs> Again, positive or negative. Just don't. Just leave them alone. Leave them alone. Um, you aren't their I'm coach. Special you... teams, I'm going to go with just a, a B minus, I guess. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, that feels fine. The, the, the special teams was such an afterthought this year. I it's just, just I, like I, it existed. The, I wanted the, to give them a C, but our kicker and our punter were really good most of the season, so I'll just bump them up a couple points. That's fair. Um, <laughs> if you throw shade at college players, you're a pathetic bitch. Yeah. I'll, that I'll that sums that. it up. Yeah, and by the way, that but two times if you're mad at a high schooler for not choosing your team. Mm. He's not, yeah. he doesn't even play for your school. Why are you mad at him? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, this doesn't just go for your players. This goes for the other team's players too. Just don't, just, just don't at the, don't at college football or Any, college athletes. Hey, just I tell you what, <laughs> stop tagging. You know what? Log off yeah. of Twitter. Just, just log off Twitter. I, I feel like. That that's not a sloop cast rule. I believe that's a oh, Ramsey God. at eleven Warriors rule, which is just don't ever tweet. I mean, it's a it's a foolproof strategy. So, oh, that's funny. But look All at right. my nightstand. I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> is that a reference to something? I don't know. Yes. Um, okay. Um, Austin, do you have anything in Austin's attic? Ooh, pull that one out um i i thought of it like 20 minutes ago to be fair did you really yeah yeah so do you want to mention that ohio state picks up a transfer uh from a, a safety from syracuse jihad carter yeah 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 supposedly a really talented safety number one safety in the transfer portal per 24 yeah, 7 so, and you know the fact that ohio state typically now plays three safeties on the field at a time huge is really important for us he he led syracuse in turnovers I believe he has two or three more years of eligibility. I want to say two, but again, the COVID year kind of just messes everything up. I think it's three. He probably has the third COVID year, but who knows? Um, It's two. Is it two? Sure. Regardless, he's got multiple years of eligibility. So that's really helpful. It's, it's, it's kind of like getting a Tanner McAllister, but maybe even a better version of Tanner McAllister for two years instead of one. So it feels like a win for Ohio state. Um, unfortunately they don't get Fenchel Cypress. He ends up choosing, uh, Florida state. That's the corner from Virginia. That would have been really nice to have, but can't win them all. Um, don't tweet at him. I no. just meant that. Don't, don't. Um, as this episode is being, rec- uh, recorded the game against, uh, Purdue for Ohio state hoops is tomorrow. Not sure when it'll be, be it'll it'll be released tomorrow so it's if you're listening to today. this when it came out it's tonight so um that's a pretty big big game purdue just lost to rutgers so um maybe ohio state can catch them sleeping maybe not it'll be a good game hopefully at the very least it'll be a good good litmus it's, test good good game for ohio state to see how they stack up against the rest of the big 10 so 
Ohio well, State football is over, so you might as well go some go enjoy some uh, Ohio State hoops. So it's typically not a good thing to play a really good team right after a loss. I would say typically, that's really Especially good teams one, don't tend to lose loss. twice in a row. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll see. Um, should hopefully be a good game. So if you want to tune into that, you definitely can. Um, but now beyond that, um, join us at Discord, discord.thelukecast.com. Um, if you want to become a patron, which will get you access to uh, other parts of the Discord. The Discord is free, but if you want to join uh, the premium channels of the Discord, you definitely can at Patreon. Um, but if you want to join uh, the Discord, totally free. There's some uh, premium channels we've been doing. We did. I think this is probably the most we've done in terms of um, so, uh, social screens this year. We re- oh, get yeah. together. We stream a game. We watch it together. We talk. We just kind of BS on just random things. Typically, at least one person is drinking, so that's fun. Um, and we just we it's just basically hanging out with the boys and just having a, having a good time. So if you if you want to come into that, you can. Uh, that's free. In order to get speaking uh, privileges, you have to become a patron. It's only three dollars a month. Uh, you can save a little bit of money if you decide to um, do the yearly plan. I think it's like it ends up being like thirty two to thirty six ish dollars somewhere in there. Um, so if you want to do that, you definitely can. Uh, there's a Teespring store. I think Jared's actually wearing one of the T-shirts, um, the Akron something. So, it, no, it's, just, it's just an Akron shirt. Well, there you go. Uh, so that's I, I have a line of shirts on the 7071. Uh, it's um, T Public, not Teespring. That's <laughs> They're all the same thing to me. Sorry. Uh, we used to be on Teespring, but I didn't like the quality. I mean, they didn't wear well over time. So I said, fuck them. I want some I mean, if i'm gonna ask you guys to buy stuff i want it to wear better um yeah. the jared is a fan of cities yeah i have a, i have a whole line of i call them comic book cities because it's just it's sort of meant to you can't tell through this camera but the the city is sort of stylized as is the writing to look like a comic book it's nice shirt thanks jared why do you hate small towns jared can you confirm tonight i i don't um, I haven't made them all yet, but I will be doing some very small towns in the 7071 store. Some very small, they're all Ohio towns for what it's worth. But like I, you obviously knock out the big ones first, but I'm, I'm going to keep going. Uh, Jared, what's the, uh, isn't there an all encompassing link that they can go to, to, uh, see all of the links, the sloopcast.com. Yep. Go to the sloopcast.com. That'll get you a link to the 7071 store to Patreon and to Discord again. Just join join the Discord server and we can get you all the other information you need. We have some really cool mods here. Um, if you guys uh, need any more, man, well, we've got one <laughs> or two, at least one. Um, and Gangland's here, so too. Gangland, it's Gangland. Um, yeah, yeah, Gangland is the one. Um, <laughs> but if you need any more information, join. It's free. Come talk to us, um, and we can get you whatever other information you you need. And you can try it for free if you like it. Pay three bucks a month, and you can come talk. If not. Just hang out for free. Totally fine. We want to grow the community. It's a lot better community than being on Twitter. And I think that uh, we can all pretty much confirm that. We're, we're very active in there. So, um, you yeah, know, there's always something going on. So, Zach, we'll you probably, don't get a vote. We're probably going to end up maybe even watching the game tomorrow. So, if any of you join by tomorrow, uh, which is today for you guys, may, we'll be maybe, in there. Maybe, 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 maybe not. Oh, okay. England, we'll it, might be a mo- it might be a mod screen. Yeah. So if you guys want to come join us, you totally can. Um, regardless, we'll be screening stuff throughout the uh, basketball season. So come join us at discord.thesloopcast.com. And I think that's it. If you have a band, you can go ahead and just end the show at this point. Ooh. Can You've we already. The vapors? You can do playing the vapors. Sure. Just, you you did all the plugging. You did you did Austin's Attic. You I'm took here. care of all the plugs. Just, just end the show. I'm just trying to give you, uh, you know, uh, this will be some playing to oh there he goes this will be some playing the vapor song not sure which one yet i guess we'll let jared pick that um oh do i even remember the outro let's see uh with that being said (laughs) (laughs) with that being said (laughs) i can't can't do it i broke him Uh, i broke him i'm I'm broken uh be sure to drink local beer listen to local music and of course support your local podcasters this is Playing the Vapors.